everybody. Welcome back to CAF's Heroes of Sport. My name is Bob Babin, and every week we get to meet one of the world's most amazing challenged athletes. And it's not often that we get to meet someone and chat with someone who is maybe the greatest female endurance athlete in history. 17 Paralympic medals, 24-time winner of marathon majors, Tatiana McFadden joins us. Tatiana, how are you? Hello, thank you so much for having me. It's such a treat. Well, first I wanna start with your movie. Uh, besides all the accolades as an athlete, you're also an author and then produced Rising Phoenix. Talk a little bit about how that came about because the movie has touched a ton of lives and, and changed a lot of lives. Yeah, I am so proud of Rising Phoenix. It's done amazing things for not only for the Paralympics, but for the disability community. So I was very honored to be part of it because I do not have a film background in school. I studied to become a child life specialist. So it's very out of my realm. But four years ago, I was at the Rio Paralympics and I met a guy named Greg and we got talking about the history of the Paralympics and how you know, my journey through the games, we have a, a good games, we kind of have a bad games, good games, you know, and it alternates back and forth. And just talking about equality and um, how to push it forward because sports is an equalizer. So we could push equality through sports and we can broaden it outside of sports. And we got talking and we said, you know, the history of the Paralympics should be a movie because people have an idea of what it is, right? It's a games for athletes with physical disabilities, but they don't know how it started and how it originated by this one guy <laughs> with this one dream and he called it the Paralympics. And now it's the third largest sporting events in history. And so that's really important to capture a story that's never been told before. And um, and so he agreed. And two years later, he calls me and he said, you know, how would you like to be part of this project? Um, we really in, enjoy your advocacy and what you've done for high school. And, you know, we really want to push this film forward and we want it to be done, you know, beautifully and well. Um, so my job was I met the producers um, before filming even started and we just laid out and just talked honestly about what disability means, how U.S. views it, how it's viewed globally, and how where we want to see the change, and where the misconceptions are, and, um, and how we could do it really beautifully um, through film, because pictures say a thousand words. And working with Ian Peter, it was just amazing. And it was so good to have these open and honest discussions with producers who never worked with people with disabilities before. Another part of my job was to, um, you know, as we were filming nine, in, nine athletes total, as, as everyone told their story, and as we, one common ground is that, you know, we talked about equality and we talked about disability. Well, why don't we have hire people with disabilities to work on this film people who are creative in their own crafts yeah. and to me that was super important because we have to stay true to our word you know if we're talking about it why don't we put it into action and so 16 percent of the people who worked on the film had a physical disability and it was just amazing to see what the directors learned and they were shocked by, you know, a few things that they learned. Um, one example would be Ellie, a researcher from London, and they didn't realize how hard it was for her to find an accessible building to just to do her job, right? So they, they did that. And, you know, she also had to find transportation too. So they kind of got an eye opening of what it's like today even. Um, living life with a disability. So it was just amazing to have these open and honest discuss discussions. And the reactions of this film has been so amazing. I mean, people have said, wow, I didn't really know that the Paralympics was parallel to the Olympics. And sometimes I forget that because 
you know, I train for it every day and I compete every four years. So right. I forget that other people don't know. Um, but this film, you know, told it all. And it was a perfect time to have a film like this come out where people, you know, when the pandemic hit, they actually, you know, watched it on Netflix um, and really took the time to educate themselves. And I think they were in such awe as well. Um, and they captured imagery so elegantly and so beautiful um, of all the athletes. What's fascinating to me is I was able to go to the Paralympics in London and then go to Rio and to see the dichotomy of, I went to London and I was like, oh my God, look where the Paralympics have come. It's, this is spectacular. The venues, Channel 4 in London was covering, doing more coverage than they were the Olympics. And you had Oscar Pistorius and Blake Leeper. And it, it was like everything, it was a perfect storm. And the Paralympics, I think, was above the Olympics when it came to 2012. Then we went to Rio. <laughs> and they almost didn't, you know, your film show almost didn't happen, right? They were like, oh, we're out of money. We just won't do it. And stadiums were half full and then things turned around. But for yourself, seeing where you're at after London, you must have been thinking, okay, look where we're going. Was, was it hard when you saw what was happening in Rio? Because talk about an inaccessible city. I was with a wheelchair athlete there and just going to getting through streets, curbs with the curb cutouts all being different. It was, it was really a, a hard experience for people in chairs in Rio. I think what really, um, you know, Rio was, <laughs> for Rio, um, you know, the game, the Paralympics almost didn't happen um, for us. And I think that was the hardest part was that all athletes spent <laughs> four years training and to get the news of that, you know, that's <laughs> before we even got to go, you know, within that summer time period, less than a year to go. Um, you know, it was tough, um, but you kind of have to lay that aside and just completely focus on, on training because once you arrived, you know, everything fell into, into place. And once, once the public got to see the Paralympics, um, I think people were uh, amazed and, I think people wanted more and more. Um, stadiums started to fill up. Um, people were really genuinely interested in going to the Paralympics. So that was the the amazing part was that everything was was turned around, um, and it became a very successful games from a little bit of a rough start. Yeah, in London we had eighty five thousand people in the stands. Everything was sold out early in the Paralympics in, in Rio, I just think over the time of the Paralympics, there became a bond between the people of Rio who are struggling financially. And I think they connected to the athletes who have their own struggles. There just seemed to be a coming together of the people of Rio, the people of Brazil with the athletes. Don't you feel that there was some, there was a pretty incredible bond with the athletes and with the fans? Yeah, it was definitely, it was definitely a celebration. Um, after I won one of my gold medals, um, I was surrounded by, um, a group of Brazilians and they did, you know, a dance and they were cheering and they were so excited. And, um, you know, I think, yeah, they were just genuinely, um, eager to see the sports and being educated on disability and being amazed by what Paralympians can do. Um, and the records being broken and how, you know, how fast people are running. Um, so yeah, it was very cool. So for you, you have been an advocate for basically since high school, right? You were trying to run, be on your high school team. First, they didn't want you on the high school team in a wheelchair. Then it was, oh, you can come out, but you're going to go on your own and just be going in front of the crowd by yourself. Having the, you and your mom basically having the, uh, the grit to decide, we're going to go to court on this because this is wrong. How tough was that and how rewarding when things turned out the way they did? 
It was very tough. Um, it was very tough to be an advocate at the age of 15 because uh, you're just a freshman in high school. And, but I knew it was wrong. You know, I knew that it was wrong that I was denied a uniform, um, that I was, you know, denied to participate in high school track meets. Um, and so I wanted to do something about it. And I felt like after coming home with a medal, a bronze medal, I thought, well, I do have a voice essentially, and I want to use it for the good. Um, and I really focused on my younger sister, Hannah, who's also a Paralympic athlete. She right. was in London and in Rio. And I thought, well, if I don't have this opportunity, there's no way she's going to have this equal opportunity. So yeah, we decided to, to sue and we prevailed and it took all four years to fight, but it became federal law, the sports and fitness equity act. Um, and it forever changed um, high school athletics for people with disabilities. So that was pretty amazing that people can no longer be denied um, to participate in high school sports um, because of their disabilities. So it was a very tough thing to go through for four years. People didn't really understand why. I was always bullied for the four years it, because, you know, it's, I got comments like, well, there's sports of your own kind. Why don't you just go there? You know, track is, um, you know, they didn't really understand, you know, it was an advantage point. And I said, no, like racing chairs aren't a vantage point. We don't have any gears. So it was really creating an education system at that point. Um, and it was really hard to be the first to do that, um, but, I knew that I needed to do it. Otherwise it would have never been done. And there was a local boy actually who also went to my local sports program. Mm -hmm. Ben, um, he was a senior at the time and he was denied to participate in his high school track team for three years in high school. And when I won, um, he, it was his last year. And he, when he got to participate um, on the team, it was the very first time that he had the, the boys track team over at his house, you know, after a celebration, after a track meet. And, you know, for me, that, that's what it was all about. I mean, I felt sad that it was his last year, but, um, it's, I'm glad that he got to experiment, um, that he got that experience. And I'm glad that the, his track team got to experience Ben to be on his team. So it was a very tough uh, four, four years, but um, I'm just very happy that it happened. So when I look at, you know, the 17 Paralympic medals and all the marathon wins and you'd won Boston five times, what impresses me is sometimes those races where you don't win, but you still have an amazing day. 2019, Boston Marathon, freezing, cold, rainy, all that stuff going on, and you flip, right? I bet the crowd loved that. You hit the railroad tracks, you flip over. And oh, yeah, they, they, they certainly did. They were like in shock. <laughs> <laughs> so when you get up and get back in, you're back in sixth place. And when you're racing, you're in a racing chair, the key is to be with the group. Now you're not with the group. You're by yourself. You got to basically work your way back up and you end up getting silver anyways. One, you'd won the thing five times, so obviously you won the win. But getting second, was that a great memory just because of what you went through? It was. It was definitely a memory. Um, it was so wet and so slippery. And um, those railroad tracks are really tricky to go over. And before I knew it, I saw the sky. So I was like, oh, okay. Um, it like shocked me and it shocked the crowd. But yeah, getting back up was the only choice that I had and just to keep going. Um, and I knew that if I could keep a certain pace, if I could stay with a certain group of um, female wheelchair racers and go back and forth on the draft and then move forward, you know, just try to keep going up and up. Um, it was a really hard thing to do because, you know, I was so close. Like I saw the police cars, right? So like I could see Manuela in my vision and I knew that I just needed to get to Heartbreak Hill. <laughs> and like, I would have, you know, caught her by then or 
around like a little bit later um, because it, it, there's more climbing. So that part was kind of hard, um, knowing that, you know, I automatically knew that I wasn't going to win um, because I knew moments in the race where I needed to catch her in order to succeed. So it was really tough, but I thought, well, getting top three isn't bad. So I have to work my way up to that um, and just really dig deep. It was really hard. Uh, my wrists were actually hurting um, because I fell right on them. So it was, uh, it was tough. It was, it was cold and wet and raining. Your wrists were hurting, but um, the fans in Boston are amazing. And so they just kind of, you just listen out and they uh, can get the energy from them. Love it. So you have been a Nike athlete for a, for a while and Nike uh, was when they started the Just Do It program, I think Craig Blanchett, one of the top wheelchair racers, was one of their first Just Do It athletes. They, they believed in athletes dealing with overcoming for a long time. How important has that partnership been for you? It's been really important. Um, it's been amazing to see the transformation as well. I mean, just from, you know, their first, you know, athlete, um, Paralympic athlete, and, you know, to to see the Paralympic athletes that they have now um, and the commercials that they're doing. I mean, it's awesome. Um, and it's, I'm proud to, to be a, in, um, to be part of the team. Um, you know, I had my own commercial at the Chicago marathon yep. with the other um, Chicago marathon runners. That was amazing. That was the first for them. Um, I was part of the Serena Williams commercial. Um, so it's just been amazing to see the transformation and the growth and to see um, the adaptability that they're providing in their shoes um, from, you know, one, um, I think his name is, um, um, I'm trying to think of what his name is, um, but he helped to, he wrote a letter to Nike Yes, um, design a shoe yeah. for somebody who has a hard time tying their shoes. Yeah, exactly. And now they have the you know the flyies out where you just step in and um, and your shoes on. So it's amazing to see the adaptability and the transformation that um, and the growth that we've seen through Nike over the years. I think it's important because you know with body types, you know people are constantly comparing, um, even though it's not healthy too. But so it's amazing to see that, well, I can wear that because that person with a disability is wearing it and it looks cool and it looks great. Or maybe that person without a disability is wearing that adaptable shoe. Um, so it became a universal design, um, which is, you know, for everybody. So it was, it's great to see and it's great to be part of that partnership. So as somebody who's been at the Paralympics 2004, 2008, 2012, 2016, you are going to go in, in 2020. Having this year of COVID uh, and having to put off going to the Paralympics until 2021, has it, how have you dealt with that, not being able to race? And, you know, really, I don't know how much it's impacted your training, but I'm guessing it has. It's been really tough. Um, it's been, it's been, some days are, you know, are tougher than others, but um, I think it's, you know, one thing that I tried to help with myself is keeping a constant schedule, getting up and training. Um, I do live in Florida where I can train outside so I can be by myself and I can be solo. Um, but it's been an adjustment. Um, you know, athletes were, were used to adjustments. Uh, I think people with disabilities are used to adapting. Um, but I think the hardest challenge has been no competitions. Um, and I'm not really sure if I'll get in a competition before Tokyo. So that's been another hard part. Um, you know, I think the also learning a different lifestyle and you, know, you can't go out and socialize like you used to. So oh. you're more in isolation. So I think that's hard as well, especially people who are living alone. Um, so I've been loving FaceTime um, and you know, talking to my family and my friends. Um, but it's also allowed me to take the time for myself. I mean, athletes are, we're constantly traveling. We're constantly going here and there. So it's given me a full year of no traveling, just really focusing on my health and training, um, prepping meals and just laying low and trying to stay healthy. Um, so I can be 
be ready as much as possible. You know, I think everyone is in, in the same boat. Yeah. Um, so it's been tough. And I think a couple of years ago, we, we saw you at our Heroes Heart and Hope <laughs> Gala in New York. Hopefully yeah. we'll have that again. Was it that was, fun for you? Yeah, I was in New York. It was so much fun. Yeah, that was, um, that was a lot of fun. I sat with, um, I think I sat, I don't know which table that, but Des and I sat together. Um, oh, it was Linden. a lot of fun. Yep. What? Are you Des Linden? Yeah, yeah, it does yeah, nice together. It was yep. yeah, it was so much fun. Um, my first my first little gala, it was great. It was great to see um the athletes come up and speak, um, what the organization does. So it's been wonderful. I mean, you guys helped my sister Hannah oh, get a wonderful. running leg. Yeah. So how have you when you look back, how have you changed as an athlete over the years? I've learned a lot. <laughs> I definitely have learned so much um, just about nutrition and training and recovery is the key, especially getting older. Um, much different now, you know, compared to my 20s and taking a lot more time to recover, um, right. staying injury free. Um, it's just, yeah, I think when you hit 30, everything, you're like, wow, I need to make it another adjustment. Uh, it's time. So just kind of learning about yourself as you get older, because training does change uh, compared to when you're in your 20s. So thinking back to the, you know, when your birth parents abandon you and you're in an orphanage and the fact, the, the fact that you ran into Deborah, who adopted you, I mean, that chance meeting changed your life, her life, the destiny of, of challenge athletes worldwide when you look back at the, your journey, how do you look back on it? Yeah, I mean, um, my life definitely started, you know, atypical, um, not a typical childhood, um, growing up in St. Petersburg, Russia, and being born with, with spina bifida in the, you know, 80s, that was born in 89, it was a different time. It was a time of fall of communism, everything was changing in Russia, it was a hard, hard time for everybody. And my birth mom could not take care of me financially um, with the resources, just nothing was there. So she just did the best thing she could and put me in an orphanage and hoped that I would, you know, have a better life one day. Um, it was very unknown. And so the six year changed when my mom happened to walk through the door and she was on a business trip. Um, and she wasn't looking to adopt. Uh, so it was faith that I felt like that brought us together the sixth year. Um, and everything changed when I came to the, to the U.S. Love it. Thank you so much for taking time, Tatiana. It's such a treat. And also, uh, you're a fellow University of Illinois grad. Yes. I, I went a little <laughs> earlier than you did. <laughs> Class of 73. Uh, but you know what's fascinating to me, even back then, I remember walking around the campus and there were cutouts in the curbs back in, you know, 70, 71. It was so revolutionary and so ahead of its time in terms of awareness. We had a basketball team called the Giz Kids and all that. We used to go watch wheelchair basketball back in 1970 and 71. That school was, don't you think, was pretty much ahead of its time? Oh, yeah, it was definitely ahead of its time. Um, I mean, we have a Paralympic training center there now, but yeah, way ahead of his time, um, which is amazing, you know, going to that university felt like it was easier to go to because students were um, accepting because they've seen people with disabilities constantly. Yeah. Um, so no one really questioned, you know, um, which was pretty cool. Tatiana, thank you so much for joining us on CAF's Heroes of Sport. When we talk about heroes of sport, right at the top of that list is Tatiana McFadden. You are very, very special. Thank you. Thank you. Again, this has been CAF's Heroes of Sport. <laughs> My name is Bob Babbitt. Join us next time. Until then, see ya.